This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. Uh, today, my special guests are going to be speaking about the Vermont Folklore Center, uh, and my uh, guests uh, are uh, uh, Kathleen Hoy, the Executive Director of the Vermont Folklore Center, and Andy Calavos, the Director of Archives and Research for this very interesting facility. Welcome to Positively Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. First of all, uh, tell us each uh, a little bit about yourself and what you do with the Vermont Folklore Center. Well, um, I, it's the Vermont Folklife Center, and I'm the director there. I have a background in music performance and Spanish literature, um, and then I studied ethnomusicology in grad school, and that's what brought me to Vermont and the job at the Folklife Center. Um, I'm interested in studying a lot of different things through ethnomusicology, but right now I'm working on my dissertation and I'm working um, with Bhutanese Nepali refugee musicians in Burlington and working to help sustain their cultural traditions. So that's just a little bit about Andy. my own background. Tell us about yourself, Andy. Well, um, I first came to Vermont in the late 80s as a Bennington College student uh, where I studied literature and then eventually went to graduate school to study folklore. You can do that at Indiana University. And while I was there, I kept thinking, what am I going to do with a degree in folklore? So I also got a library science degree. So I'm an archivist and a folklorist. And that's what brought me to Vermont, was getting a message from the Folklife Center founder, Jane Beck, saying, hey, are you interested in a job? So they brought me out, and I've been here ever since. That's great. Well, the Vermont Folklife Center uh, is very interesting. Tell us a little bit about the history of it. Yeah, so uh, the Vermont Folklife Center, it's a cultural research and education nonprofit uh, statewide, but our offices are based in Middlebury. Um, it was founded in 1984 by folklorist Jane C. Beck. Um, before that, she was the state folklorist at the Vermont Arts Council. Um, and previously, kind of our uh, focus in the 80s and 90s was more in kind of old time Vermont. Um, but through the years, we've shifted to also be paying a lot of attention to contemporary life, and um, so, so we, we do both, I'd say, at this point. And um, we have four programs that we can talk about. Do you want to talk sure. about the archive? And yeah, I mean, one of the key things we do is interview people out in the state. Mm -hmm. And um, the nature of those interviews is th the best way to think about it is like we're cultural anthropologists in Vermont, although we're not anthropologists, which my wife, who is an anthropologist, likes to remind me. <laughs> um, but the archive is where all the research ends up. And it's a collection of about 5,000 audio recordings, several hundred videotapes, and we estimate about 25,000 images. Um, the recordings date back to the 40s. Um, as far as original recordings. And the content they contain, we estimate, goes back to the 1870s, depending on the time they were made and the age of the person interviewed. Um, the collection, we do, we add our own stuff to it as we create new recordings, and we also take in donations. So we have all sorts of donated collections, including, you know, for example, one is uh, material from folk singer Margaret MacArthur, who was recording folk songs in Vermont in the 60s. So she gave us all of her tapes, and we've digitized all that and made it all available online. Well, I'd like you to describe what the facility looks like uh, at present and how it evolved over the years. Okay, well, uh, today we're at an old building. I don't know exactly when it was um, built. Early 19th century. I can't remember the exact date, but the between 1810 and 1825. It's a big old red brick building in between Otter Creek Bakery and Two Brothers on the traffic circle in Middlebury, <laughs> That's downtown a great Middlebury. Location. That's a really great location. It it's, is. Uh, Middlebury is a wonderful place. It's a, just the great atmosphere there. Yeah, and we've kind of moved around over the years, but we've been there for about the past 10. I, I think believe. so. It feels, yeah, it's mm -hmm. about that long. It feels longer and shorter at the same time. Right. And do you have uh, visiting uh, hours and uh, uh, yep. a program of people when people can visit? Yes, we are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 5. And we have a gallery. Our first floor, we have two gallery spaces. Um, we have a vision and voice gallery which Andy can talk more yeah. about. Um, and we also have an upstairs where our offices are, and we have a workshop space there. We teach workshops for people in the community. Um, and our basement is the archive, and we have a recording studio down there. Um, on the same floor as the galleries, we also have a small shop where we sell uh, Vermont-made items stemming, you know, it could be Somali Bantu embroidery or 
uh, blacksmith. We have we have like hooks and stuff that a local blacksmith has been making. Um, hand weaving. Hand weaving. That's great. A lot of Vermont-based art. Well, what I'd like to focus on uh, for our viewers is some of the the current projects and programs that you're involved in. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about this Discovery Community Education Project? Yeah, so Discovering Community is one of our four major programs. Again, that's Archive, um, our Vision and Voice Gallery, and our Traditional Arts Apprenticeship Program. And then our fourth is Discovering Community. And that program gets young people out into the community using media to tell stories about their, themselves and their own experiences as well as people in their community. And so we offer workshops um, in public schools and private schools, and we do professional learning opportunities for educators. We have a summer institute in the summer, which kind of puts teachers through the, 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 the whole um, process of learning about ethnography and media documentation and the ethics behind that. And then they go out into the field and do some research and documentation, and then they create a final media piece, and that's kind of the same process that the young people in the schools um, that we work with would go through. So that's um, kind of a small kind of snippet of what we do with our education program. Excellent. Yeah, its focus is basically teaching teachers to do what we do. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's interesting. And uh, do you encourage class visits and things like that? Uh, you go out to classes? Yep, yep, we do. We've, um, I think we've worked this year so far, we've worked with over 700 students in Vermont. Um, we usually do between 25 and 30 different projects in different schools per year. So uh, we're kind of all over the place with the education <laughs> program. That's amazing. That's, uh, that's really vast, actually. Yeah. And one thing about uh, uh, we discussed before uh, we started, uh, tell us about this traditional arts apprenticeship program. Yeah, so that program started in 1991, and it's uh, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts. And that program uh, pairs a master in some type of cultural, traditional cultural expression with someone or a group of people who are interested in learning that. So um, that could range from Somali Bantu instrument making, or blacksmithing, or hand weaving, or Nepali folk dancing. Um, so every year we support between 15 and 20 apprenticeship projects. And again, those are statewide. Um, over the years, when, it, when that program started, we were focusing mo mostly on supporting Abenaki artists and basket weavers. Um, and as the years have gone by and more refugees are being resettled in Vermont, we've started supporting a lot of different um, refugee artists and musicians and dancers and uh, helping to sustain their, their cultural traditions. Well, this was indicates uh, the, the changing uh, landscape of, of, of people in Vermont. Uh, normally, uh, someone, particularly someone from out of state who's watching this, might think of Vermonters as, as a certain category of mm -hmm. people. Uh, can you tell us uh, what types of uh, new people have come into Vermont and, and what uh, have they brought to our uh, folk life? Well, we can't forget the hippies, uh, <laughs> you know, and the, the culture of Vermont was radically changed by, by back to the landers and hippies who came up here in the 70, 60s and 70s. So that's a big piece of the culture change we've experienced. Um, and then, of course, there are people like us who weren't born here but come here for work or for some other reason and mm -hmm. love living in Vermont and with us we bring our background and that has an impact on how things go. Um, I don't know much about the history of refugee resettlement in Vermont and I don't know if you know the details of that at all. Um, not all of them but I mean I think in the late 80s early 90s is when it really started happening here um, formally at least through the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program um, and through the years uh, you know, B Bosnian people started arriving, then Somali Bantu. Um, the latest kind of group is uh, the Bhutanese Nepali uh, communities who are being resettled here. Um, so it's just, you know, every, every couple of years there's, there's a new, new group. And, um, you know, we've been working with, with those groups from, from the beginning, yeah, really. Since and the 80s and 90s. Really? Have really close partnerships with community organizations um, like the... Uh, Vermont Tibetan Association and the Vermont Nepali Heritage Dance Group and uh, you know the Somali Bantu Association so we've been kind of involved in supporting the cultural activities of, of refugees since you know they've been arriving here in Vermont. And immigrants to the states who settled here mm -hmm. from all over the world have always been a 
one of the focuses of our work. Um, gosh, remember the year he published it? Um, the, the original director of education, Greg Sharrow, put together a book called Many Cultures, One People that was an immigration history of Vermont pulled together through primary sources and also interviews. And it included um, Vietnamese, who were some of the earliest refugees mm -hmm. resettled here, Lao people, and folks from all over the world. I mean, there's a chapter on Finns and the Finnish community in Vermont and on the Dutch community. Uh, there were a lot of Dutch farmers who settled in Addison County. So it's, uh, Vermont is an, it, way more complicated than most people realize. I know uh, quite a few people from the Nepali community, but I didn't know we had Finns uh, emigrating here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's old immigration. Old immigration. <coughs> that's right. old immigration. Yeah, that's historic immigration. Amazing. Welsh. Uh, you know, there was mm -hmm. Welsh community in, in Slate. And certainly the Somali community. Now, now, how how does the Vermont Folk Life Center interact with with these new Vermonters, uh, and maybe preserving their cultural heritage or or uh, uh, researching their cultural heritage. Tell you how, how you do that. Uh, well, a lot of the ways in which we uh, initially are interacting with new Americans are through our apprenticeship, our traditional arts apprenticeship program. And so, um, but we do field work in order to um, meet people and learn, you know, who in the community is uh, considers himself an artist, or are there people who are doing traditional things? Maybe they don't consider it art, but you know, um, need support in finding the resources in order to do that. And so um, through our research as cultural ethnographers, um, we identify people and we have conversations and we interview people to figure out what it is that we can do to um, help sustain their work. And also we archive those interviews and have them around for, for people in the future. To listen to. What, what kind of uh, access uh, are these archives, uh, do they afford to people in the state? Well, the archive itself is open by appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just call, make an appointment, and we try to find a time for you to come in. A handful of stuff is available online, um, uh, and it's mostly music collections, and it includes a number of Franco-American music collections, uh, English language folk song, and then a bunch of oral history material. That's amazing. Now, one of the recent uh, projects was this uh, Franco-American uh, project. Tell us about that, please. Well, Dan, to go back to the topic of immigrants, you know, Franco-Americans were probably the largest single immigrant group to Vermont over various points in time in the 20th century. And one of the things that a lot of Franco-Americans I know will say, particularly older people, is that there was a period in time where it was not terribly cool um, to be French-Canadian descent, you know, and people they were stigmatized for it and all sorts of stuff. And what I've noticed since I've been here is that by and large, that stigma is gone, mm -hmm. you know, and that the number of French last names in, across the state has, you know, proliferated. And what people have lost uh, is the language, first mm -hmm. and foremost, um, although many still have it and many still do maintain connections to relatives in Canada. But uh, the two pervasive things that stick around are um, food and certain types of celebrations and also music. So a lot of our interaction around French-Canadian culture, Franco-American culture, in Vermont has been around music. Um, in the 90s, we worked with a woman named Martha Pellerin, who some people may remember, uh, who was a cultural advocate and singer, um, song collector herself. And she, when she passed away, um, gave her whole collection of recordings and songbooks to the Folk Life Center. And one of our projects several years ago was scanning those, transcribing them, and then trying to make them available online to people to access the content. And one of the things we realized is that, well, if you have songs that are written down, um, people don't necessarily remember the tunes. Mm -hmm. You know, so we reached out to a colleague of ours named Lisa Ornstein, who is an archivist and also an amazing uh, French-Canadian style fiddler, um, who is an expert in this area, to figure out what the tunes are, classify them a little better, and then also, uh, one of our key things was figure out a way to make this material accessible to people of Franco-American descent who don't speak French. Mm -hmm. You know, so to provide phonetic uh, versions of the song so that they can sing the words and then provide synopses or translations so they could understand what the songs are about and then also have some of the context of this song within the family that created the songbook or within French Canadian culture in general. So the two projects we're working on simultaneously, and Lisa Ornstein is involved in both of them, is to do more, um, more uh, I'm going to say more deeper, more deeper, uh, deeper cataloging of the collections we have, which mm -hmm. include the stuff from Martha Pellerin, and what she's focusing on is a collection from the Baudouin family, the Baudouins, who are a 
Burlington-based musical family. Um, they still live, well, some of them still live in the Lakeside neighborhood where they grew up. Um, <coughs> to create those sorts of materials to, and then um, get that stuff online and then also to work with um, Carmen Bodwin, uh, one of Louis Bodwin, the Fiddler's Daughters, and uh, a woman named Kim Chase to develop a program to basically teach kids these songs as, as a component of Vermont cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. So not even trying to frame it as just Franco-American cultural heritage, but make the point that Franco-American culture is Vermont culture. It's very interesting. I mean, the, the idea about songs, I, I spent a lot of time in Ireland, and you could have a song that has 19 different versions of it, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's the same thing in a way with that. And, and what, what about uh, uh, photography uh, and, and visual uh, uh, expressions of uh, folk life? Uh, how do you work with that? Well, the primary way we do that is through our exhibit program. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the long short of our exhibit program is the organization as an independent organization got its start with an exhibit. Um, Jane Beck pu pulled together an exhibit called Always in Season, Folk Art in Vermont that toured the state. And um, since that time, we've had different flavors of an exhibit program going on. Um, lately, we've been doing a lot of exhibits that focus on photography and often mix that photography with audio, either from our archive or stuff that we've created or stuff people have loaned us. So um, the current exhibit we have is um, photos taken by a couple named Neil and Suzanne Rappaport. And Neil and Suzanne both taught at Bennington College. They were there when I was there. Neil used to really intimidate me. Um, <laughs> and uh, didn't know Suzanne when I was a student, but when I came up here, um, met her and really, really came to love Suzanne. She, they both passed away. They both died of cancer over a period of several years. Um, but back in, gosh. 1952. Yeah, two brothers, uh, their mother passed away and they sealed up the house. And my impression is that Neil and Suzanne, in Paulette, Vermont, where Neil and Suzanne were, and what Neil and Suzanne, one of their, their big avocations was doing this massive documentary project of Paulette. They photographed everybody in town from the early 70s until the mid 80s. And that's another resource we actually have online. We're working on revamping the database that Neil created so you could see all these pictures. But um, So they were aware of this house and they were interested in seeing the inside. And one day, one of the brothers un unlocked the door and let him in. And what they saw was essentially a time capsule of this woman's home. So Neil took um, really very beautiful, powerful photographs of it. And then to add to it, um, Suzanne sat in the house and hand colored each photo from life. So, Over the course of a year. Yeah, a year in the cold until it got too cold, and then she had to bring them home with bring you know bring the images home with her and work on. Them. So that that exhibit is currently on display, and it's a powerful collection of photos and really an interesting way to think about documentary, right? Where you have these photographs of this place telling a story of this woman's life, and then you have someone else bringing their own personal and subjective touch to how they interpret that space, which honestly is something that we would say is all documentary, whether mm -hmm. it's photos, film, or whatever, there's always a subjective element to it. And in the case of Neil's, Neil and Suzanne's photos, the subjective element is you can't escape it because it's, 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 it's integral to the images themselves. That's amazing stuff. And what about letters and, and personal correspondence? I, I know we, we did a project on the, uh, the mill in, in uh, Winooski, and there, there's a lot of uh, lore that came in, p per people's letters back to their relatives and things like that. Do you, do you deal with letters and those kinds of documents? Yeah, very, very little correspondence in the collection. Um, usually what we say is that we're primarily an audio archive mm -hmm. and video and film are a component of that, but audio really is the focus. And we do have uh, papers and letters associated with certain collections, but usually when they're tied to a larger body of media. So uh, Greg, uh, Sharrow did a series, many, many interviews with a woman named Catherine Duclos, who lived in, in Braintree, Vermont. And um, Catherine gave us recordings she made with her father in the 60s. Wow. And then when Catherine passed away, a whole collection of family photographs and diaries came to us. So that collection is a whole cohesive body. And the reason we have that extra stuff is because we have all the other stuff, too. We have a very interesting website, and there's, there's a lot of interactive kind of uh, sources of material. Tell us a little bit about that. We're going to put that on our line here. And uh, tell us about the website, who created it, and uh, what's available there. Well, we just read at our w website about two years ago now. And we, it, it's through Squarespace, the <laughs> <laughs> website <laughs> platform. Um, and we were able to do it largely within our staff. But we have a, you know, an outside consultant that helps us a little bit. Um, and on our website, you can find 
information about the work we do and our different programs. Um, some archival collections are on there. Um, we have a blog called Field Notes where we write about some of the recent work that we're doing and um, share photos or audio from, from that. Um, so you can sign up to re it's re wait. Do we send it out? You can plug? sign up to get a notice when it gets updated. Okay. So and we field we put notes. up a new field yeah. note every couple of weeks or so. Um, we also have a newsletter that you can sign up for th via our website, and that goes out once a month um, just to update people about what we're doing. Um, what else about our website can we say? Well, there's links through the archive section to the online archive and some other resources that way. And we've also our Discovering Community Education program. We have kind of a um, separate site for that, but you can access it through our Vermont Folklife Center website. And there are a lot of examples of student projects and student-based kind of ethnography and media and storytelling projects that we've done or supported with schools. Um, so there's a lot of that up there too. That's great. Well, we're recording this at the beginning of March, uh, and why don't you uh, tell our audience uh, what's going to be happening throughout the rest of the year? Okay. Um, well, right now we have the exhibit called Up Home, which Andy spoke about with the hand-colored photographs, and that will be up through, I believe, the end of this month, end of March. And then we'll have another exhibit um, starting in April of Richard Brown's photographs. Um, and. The next exhibit, I believe, is about kind of the farming renaissance that's happening in the Rutland area with a lot of older farmers who are um, mentoring younger farmers who are just interested in, in getting involved in farming, but there's a lot of you know <laughs> uh, cost and um, time, and they need more support from these farmers. So we're, we're doing a video uh, and um, audio documentation of, of what's happening there. So that will be our next exhibit. Um, in the spring, we offer a lot of uh, different workshops through our Cultural Sustainability Institute and series. Um, so those workshops range from Storytelling for Social Change, which we're offering on March 17th in Stowe, to um, The Art of the Interview, which Andy teaches. Um, we also do workshops on audio recording. Um, what other workshops do we have coming yeah. up? I think we're I'm trying to think. this. That might be it. There might be some, there might <laughs> might be some, some video, document, yeah. documentary, like how to make a documentary workshops. Um, those are all, you can go on our website and find out the dates for those. Might be doing a comics workshop, um, ah. a nonfiction cartooning workshop from historical sources. So that's right. another thing that might be happening in June. That's cool. um, we also have a fundraising concert in Middlebury on April 21st at 7 p.m. And that is Anna and Elizabeth, who are kind of an up-and-coming folk music duo. Anna's from Vermont. Do you want to talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Anna and Elizabeth really started focusing on Appalachian music, mm -hmm. and they got interested in looking at um, New England and Vermont music. So they came to us to access the archive and see what material was there. And they also work with the Helen Hart Miss Flanders Ballad Collection, which is a huge collection of traditional songs at Middlebury. Um, what they do is really their own thing, but it's very much tied to the tradition. So it's it's a curious, it's an updating and um, a reinvention at the same time. It's really fascinating, and that's exactly the kind of thing we like we like to support. These things don't exist in amber, you know. They're constantly changing and evolving. And if there's one one thing we want to take away for, it's that that we're interested in the past, but we're interested in the past and things from the past and how people continue to make them meaningful in the present. That's great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Andy Kalavos uh, and Kathleen Hoy from the Vermont Folklife Center. Uh, thank you for appearing with us here on Positively Vermont. Check out their website and all the very exciting things in, uh, going on in this very interesting field. Uh, this has been Dennis McMahon for Positively Vermont.